We've had special hearings for the business sector, the legal profession, the health sector and the media. This past week, our country's religious leaders had the opportunity to examine their past roles before the Truth Commission, and especially to look at the one thing religious leaders ought to be good at, reconciliation. Christians of all denominations, Jews, Muslims and Hindus, asked for forgiveness as bishops, pastors, rabbis, imams and other religious leaders, one after the other, confessed their sins of the past, their passivity, even complicity, but mostly their silence over the evil system of apartheid. As pastors, we delighted in preaching and teaching about the Good Samaritan and pointing the finger at others, while all the time we should have applied the lesson to ourselves. We, the white members of the leadership of our charismatic and Pentecostal churches, sincerely seek the forgiveness of our black counterparts within the church. Many of these black leaders try to show us the error of our ways, but pride and often a sense of superiority blinded us. We seek the forgiveness of our colleagues within the larger religious community for the times when we lack the courage and conviction to walk alongside you in your demands for justice and righteousness. We took too long to come to this place of a clearer, uncompromising witness. We allowed others to precede us and take the flack. Too late, we conceded that they were right, and we owe them an apology for our compromising and often complacent half-heartedness and sometimes for a hardness of heart that could be extremely damaging and hurtful. Archbishop, you yourself bore the brunt of this critique, not only in the nation at large, but even from the membership of your own church. May I, on behalf of the CPSA, offer to you a profound apology, ask for your forgiveness, and thank you for your extraordinary graciousness and magnanimity. In a strange way, I think many white Anglicans in the CPSA owe an apology to the Africana community for their attitude of moral superiority. But our chief expression of apology must be to our own black membership, and I'm using the word black inclusively. Chairperson, our so-called white parishes, like white businesses, and I'm thinking of last week's TRC hearings, have unquestionably benefited from apartheid and its political predecessors. In their church facilities, including housing and transport for their priests, they have been bastions of relative privilege. The exposures made by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission have filled many white people, and many of us in the Church of England in South Africa, with shock, shame, and revulsion. Looking back, it is amazing that we were so naive be that as it may, the fact of the matter is that we allowed ourselves to be misled into accepting a social, economic and political system that was cruel and oppressive. We should have been more aware, more vocal and more insightful, but we were not. For this, we are guilty. We have to say 
in the first instance, that the Catholic Church reflected indeed the divisions of the society in which it found itself. Just as, the, as apartheid divided people according to color, so did it divide the church, our church, into a black community and a white community. There was, in effect, a black church and a white church. The TRC is the only forum with some credibility and acceptability available to us in which we can publicly apologize to all those who had been hurt by the travesties of the past. It is the most effective way available to us which we can use to offer help and healing to those who had committed unacceptable, <coughs> of time even gruesome deeds against fellow South Africans. And that offer goes for people on all sides of the line. We were forbidden from bearing our own without the permit of the oppressor to minister to our own people was turned either into a criminal offense or an act for which one would be labeled as schismatic from the church Catholic. Today we wish to offer an unreserved apology to those who felt that our refusal to minister in Transkei under the stringent conditions imposed by that government was to abandon them. The wounds of that blow are still fresh for us because some of our people were permanently alienated from us as a result. I want particularly to welcome and give thanks uh, to the representatives and adherents of other faiths gathered here today. First, I want to thank you and those whom you represent for the sterling contribution that you have made to the struggle for justice freedom and democracy in this land. In the past, so-called leaders of the Hindu community, and I emphasize so-called Hindu leaders, failed hopelessly and miserably in voicing their protest against apartheid. The few who did, did so passively and not actively or for that matter, even militantly. As far as our collaboration and resistance to the system is concerned, there is the community at large. In truth, the community at large was a complacent community, feeble in its responses, and going whichever way the wind was going at a particular moment. In 1979, Imam Abdullah Harun was murdered in detention after being kept there for six months. 25,000 people attended his funeral and not a single voice in the Muslim community was raised about the nature of his death and all the injuries on his body. Not a single voice in the Muslim community from the religious leadership of the Muslim community. And this silence, Mr. Chairman, held for seven years non-stop at a mosque level and in a Muslim publication level. Of course, I speak with anger. By God, I've got a damn right to be angry. It's our job as religious people, if I may be bold to say so, the job of, of all of us to try to apply the antidotes. This TRC has become famous throughout the world because of the horror which has unfolded in the testimony so many months before you. There's no one who's listened in on the radio or who very humbly has come to sit at the back and listen to the testimony. There's no one who hasn't been moved to tears because we've had here a record of inhumanity, of the worst things that human beings can do to other human beings. 
And what we need in our country is to now change, because of that, to change to the best, to display the best that human beings can do to fellow human beings. Not the hurt and the torture and the shame, but the love and the friendship and the mutual help to lift our country up. Leaders of the traditionally black churches also spoke about the many injustices their churches had suffered. Some of them also apologized for not having done more to oppose the oppressive National Party government. Religious propaganda that emanated from the apartheid system was effective, Mr. Chairperson. It made many of our members feel guilty about any form of opposition disobedience, or even criticism of the government policy. As a result, the church was silent when it should actually have spoken out. Because of its silence, when it should have spoken, it is guilty of, collaborating, of collaboration with the system that caused great suffering to many innocent people. We knew all along that hideous things were happening, and that is often why we said what we said and did what we did. And we recognize that what is being revealed by your commission will have a profound impact on future generations in the country. There are sins to be forgiven, wounds to be bound up, hatreds to be reconciled, buildings to be rebuilt, pupils to be taught, leaders to be held accountable. Peace be unto you. The leader of the ZCC, the Zionist Christian Church, the biggest single church in Southern Africa, made a dramatic entrance with a large entourage and scores of followers wearing their trademark Silver Star. But to the surprise of everyone at the hearing, Bishop Barnabas Lekhanyane refused to speak publicly. Not even Archbishop Tutu could change his mind. Instead, the ZCC submission was read by the Bishop's Legal Council. May God bless our country. May God bless our leaders and its people. Also, I have a little. Thank you. The silent Bishop and his delegation left immediately afterwards and would not comment on why Bishop Lekhanyane had not addressed the TRC personally. No reason. That's just how we do things. That is our style. He will have it. Road, please. The hearing built up to the moment when the Enghi Kerk, the former white state church that once declared apartheid to be based on the Bible, sat down before the commission. But just before them came their former black colored and Indian daughter churches. We believe that the Uniting Reformed Church, even in its existence as the former mission church and Dutch Reformed Church in Africa, did not do enough in opposing apartheid, did not do enough in speaking clearly against the evils of apartheid. I will have a group done on the NG Kerk family, that's the four apartheid kerken. That they have to be able to verleen on the unity of Christus, not for men. That they have to be able to on the unity of Christus, that we will not the following millennium in moet gaan as a verdeelde, gereformeerde, beleidende familie. Then the big moment arrived. After months of infighting and debate, Engekerk moderator Freek Swanepoel finally faced the TRC. He immediately declared that he could not speak for all the members of his church. The movement for reconciliation is growing in our church on ground level. 
The church also continually and with empathy focused on the large numbers of people who were unjustly disadvantaged during the times of apartheid and to assist them in their poverty and suffering. A lack of understanding, unwillingness and disobedience among members and officials with regard to the need in the community. On the number of applicants who come before the Amnesty Committee of the Commission uh, to apply for amnesty, and who in their testimony to the Amnesty Committee actually blame the teachings of their church and say that they were misled by their church into believing that the things that they did were actually in the service of the interest of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That the church blessed their weapons of terror. That the church ministered to them, encouraged them. We have indeed taught our people wrongly with regard to apartheid as a biblical instruction. If you teach them that this is the way of the Bible, in fact, you instruct them how they should act. And in this regard, certainly the church has confessed that it is guilty. And we are experiencing an inner struggle to change around and turn around in this regard. When a person appears before you applying for amnesty, it is indeed true that he can say that this gospel was taught to him in this way. Certainly, there had been different messengers sent at a later stage, but people can certainly make this claim. I am so glad that uh, you have seen the, the, the you have seen the light, and and we know we could almost say to to the devil, wash out. He come the end here, In stark contrast, really, to what had taken place in the business sector hearings, where on the whole you found people in a self-justifying mode. Here. Extraordinarily, virtually every single one of those who testified uh, from the different faith communities and the different Christian denominations started off from the premise that they had done wrong. They confessed and it was heartfelt and they asked for forgiveness. And you know, that put a different slant on things and uh, had a significant uh, impact on the atmosphere that prevailed throughout the three days.